want to welcome everybody to this episode of the Doctrine of Christ. This is a big one and an important one. I guess I say that about every episode and every scripture, but it is. This is a huge lesson with huge implications. So we're going to probably take a couple weeks in studying the Lord's Supper because it is so supremely important. And I want to just give a little rundown of the books that I'm going to be referring to in this study. I'm going to be referring to four Puritan authors, those being Thomas Watson, Stephen Sharnock, John Owen, and Thomas Manton. These are four Puritan writers I'm going to be referring to, and also I'm going to be referring to The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersham, which was written in the 1800s. Um, Mr. Edersham, as his name would indicate, was a Jewish man that was converted to Christ. His father was probably the most preeminent non-Christian Hebrew scholar of his day, taught at the University of Jerusalem, and his book, which was written in the 1800s, which is a huge work on the life of Christ, has some things there that are going to be very insightful for our study. But let's begin, and let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, and let's begin in verse 15, and we'll hear the doctrine of Christ. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are celebrating the Passover. Verse 16, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And in the great commission, we are to teach all things. So ever that Christ commanded unto the disciples. And this is a commandment this do. And as the followers of Jesus Christ, we must do what he said, and we will gladly do it. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. Here is where we get definitive direction. It's not like maybe we're doing what's right, or maybe this is right or that's right. It's this do. It's a commandment of Christ, this do. So that's what we're going to do. We're not going to that do, we're going to this do. And there's a lot of that do out there. And there always has been uh, for a long time. And the that do is just not good. So I want to read from Thomas Manton, and I'm going to read from volume 15 of his uh, works, and I'm going to read on page 343. And there are so many statements that the Puritans made, and the more that I study the Puritans, and here on the DOC we talk about them a lot, and in this study this evening, we are going to see that the fight that they had in 17th century England is the same fight that we have today. They were fighting to purify the church from all the defilement, not only of Catholicism, but also of the Church of England. That's why they called them Puritans. Get back 
to Jesus Christ in the Bible. Boy, I can relate to that. And our fight today is to purify ourselves from all of the defilement in the American religious system and to get back to Jesus Christ in the Bible. So I really strongly relate to the Puritans. And I think um, we have one teacher, but boy, we have some godly counselors that have fought this fight before us. They suffered, died. They went to prison for it. They learned how to fight this fight so we can learn some things from them. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to read what Brother Manton had to say concerning this scripture as he applied it to the worship, and the Lord's Supper is worship. And I want to say also, too, that the word sacrament is not a dirty word. It has been sullied by the interpretation that Catholicism has put on it, and also Eucharist. Eucharist means to give thanks. That's not a dirty word either. But the Eucharist and sacrament, as defined by Roman Catholicism, is wrong. So just put that on the table uh, in the beginning, because that's just another layer of confusion that comes into the whole discussion. That's been going around a lot lately. I've been seeing on YouTube the discussion of... uh the Eucharist and it, what it, what it, they claim that it means. Oh yeah. So I won't get into that now. I'm sure you've got that down the line. Oh, yeah. and there, this is going to come in the discussion. There's, um, and the Puritans saw the necessity to speak out against the perversions of the Eucharist and the, the Lord's Supper in their day. We must also, and it, it's obvious. And, in, uh, on page 343, this is what Brother Mantong said. In the worship of God, which is chiefly spiritual, John 4, 24, there may easily be too much of sense brought in. Since we are so apt to be led by sense, therefore we must have recourse to the rule to what is written. That's the rule. To what is written, don't add to the word of God. This do, don't add to it, this do. As long as we are this doing what Christ said, we can't be wrong. We're going to be right if we stay in what he commanded to do. He goes on to say, and you know, we shouldn't have to have that argument. And this is the argument we're having here on the DOC. The Bible's our textbook. This is the rule of authority in our life. But we're going to see in this discussion, this is very much the argument we're having, just trying to persuade the people to go by this book instead of other books that men are using. But he goes on to say, God's ordinances look better in their own plain coat without welt or guard than in all the trimmings and flourishing gaudiness of our own devices. The sacraments were to feed men's hearts, not to please their eyes or tickle their ears. And plain bread and wine, decently distributed by the minister, looketh better and is more seemly than copes and altars and golden candlesticks and basins and all the apish immolations that have been used of late. Bread and cup. Bread and cup. That's what we're talking about. Bread and cup. We got, we don't have four or five cups. We got one cup. We got one cup. We got bread. We bless the bread. We bless the cup. Bread and cup. And understanding what it means. Don't add to it. Don't try to bring in some kind of big fancy show to it, the minute we do that, we're going to distract people's eyes from what that bread and cup represent. Such good advice. We must stick with what is written. And this is the rule that we must all impose upon ourselves. Now, Stephen Sharnock, 
And Stephen Sharnock, I think this is probably the first time we brought Brother Sharnock onto the DOC. His yeah. work. That seems like a new name to me. Yeah. Stephen Sharnock's work on the attributes of God had never been equaled. Uh, he wrote in the 1600s and and he talked about the holiness and the righteousness of God. And it's never been equaled. Um, his treat when he would get through with one of the attributes of God, you felt like you had heard everything that needed to be heard about it. And all of his works are good. But in the work he did on the attributes of God, there's nothing better that has been written since. And we'll have to look that up. Yeah. And uh, I have the his work in five volumes. And he's just another one that is of the same par. You know, we could put him right along with Manton, Owen, Watson, Bunyan, and just inspiring, deeply inspiring. And I want to read some of the things that he said uh, this evening. And um, on page 393, and the insight they had. Now, uh, on page 393 of his works, and this is from um, volume four of the works of Stephen Sharnock, and he said this, there is no transmutation, no transubstantiation, bread still, cup still, the subject for the adjunct cup for the wine contained in it. It is the same bread and cup after the consecration in regard of their nature. Now, he used a word there. Now, a lot of us know what transubstantiation is. This is the teaching of Roman Catholicism where they say that when the priest does his motion and says the word that it really becomes the body and blood of Christ. But he used another word that fewer people are familiar with, transmutation. Now, we wrote a book called Luciferian Transmutation, and Sister Donna has talked a lot about the Luciferian Mass, and I have also that, and what transmutation is. This is a change in the elements of the Lord's Supper through alchemical and magical means. This has been around for a long time. Manton knew it. That's why he dropped the word on, or excuse me, that's why Sharnock knew it. He dropped the word on it. At the time in England, there were ritual magicians like John D. some of the all-time leading occultists. Um, what years were that? Was that you're talking about with, this with Sharnock? Was written, this was written in the 1600s. So it's, this has been around for a while. Oh, a long time. And the alchemists and the Rosicrucians, um, they were in their heyday and the rise of ascension. And in 1717, it was the Rosicrucians that wrote the ritual in the Grand Lodge of England in the first three degrees of Freemasonry. But that's a, another story. But I'll give one quick illustration of how this works. Go ahead, Brother Jimmy. Well, I just love how uh, when I get to listen to you teach, it's like a history lesson all at the same time. It's just, it's, uh, I wish I'd have loved history this much when I was in school. I, I might have done a little better. Yeah. And sad to say, a lot of the history they was teaching in school wasn't the real story. Yeah, anyway. it's a little different. It's a little, it's different even now, I think, than it was when okay. I grew up. Oh, yeah. It's just got progressively worse for a long time. And uh, they just make it up daily now. You know, they yep. just make it up as they go along. Well, I'm and, just glad you've got all these books and, and, and just knowing that guys from what's that now, five, six hundred years ago, yeah. We're we're already saying all this and we've got it documented down, which that's incredible. Oh yeah. These men uh were brilliant. They knew about the occult. Uh, they weren't naive about anything. Now here's one example. This is a book called The Science of the Sacraments. It was written by a thirty third degree Freemason by the name of C. W. Leadbeater. And in the chain of command of Theosophy. It was begun by Madame Blavatsky, 
And after Madame Blavatsky passed, C.W. Leadbeater and Annie Besant were the co-heads of Freemasonry. And Mr. Leadbeater had a little problem with some underage boys, so he had to step back. And um, uh, But uh, I'm going to read what he said. And he was one that practiced this occult mass. And Crowley did it. Crowley had his Gnostic mass. Uh, this is very much a reality in the dark world. I'll read just a snippet okay. to just to show why Stephen Sharnock said there is no transmutation or transubstantiation. On page 184, this is, what he, is what he, how he describes one of these. He says, at the moment of consecration, the host glowed with the most dazzling brightness it became, in fact, a veritable sun to the eye of the clairvoyant. And as the priest lifted it above the heads of the people, I noticed that two distinct varieties of spiritual force poured forth from it, which might perhaps be taken as roughly corresponding to the light of the sun and the streamers of its corona. And there are many, many, many accounts of Leadbeater, Elipus Levi, of the occultist Pike had his Luciferian mass, so did Crowley. This is a big part of what the evil one does, pervert this holy um, ordinance we have of the Lord's Supper. That's why, just as Sharnock, and we're going to read it from others, as they spoke against the corruptions, we must also, because we have to emphasize on people, this is so important, don't you mess with it. Jesus said, this do, that's what you better do, and you better not go beyond what's written. There are very few people that would serve the Lord's Supper that I would want to even partake in it, because this is just something that you don't mess with, and it's being messed with big time, and and this is just obvious, and uh, you know, we'll talk about these things as we go along. I know you know of specific instances where it is. And, it, you know, this one fellow, if you want to talk about him or not, go right ahead. Um, if not. Yeah, we, we, maybe when we get into it, I'll bring it up. Okay. I do um, want to ask you something, though, before okay. we get too far away from that first verse you read. <clears throat> okay. You said that we do this at, at Passover. Or did you mean that that's, just when Jesus was, that just happened to be when he was doing that, or that we are literally doing it when we do it, it's, it's, it's a Passover kind of thing, no matter when it is. Does that make yeah. sense, what I'm asking? Yeah. The, when we do the Lord's Supper, it is always the celebration of Christ as the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Now we're going to get together um, at Passover time and celebrate the Lord's Supper. But you could don't have to just do it on Passover. A lot of people tell you that. That's a big porky. The Bible, Jesus said, as oft as you do it, do it yeah. in remembrance of me and, and Paul also. So um But we're but always it, celebrating Passover and what happened during that time. Yes. We are celebrating Christ our Passover that was sacrificed for us. That's great. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk about another perversion of the Lord's Supper, as is very popularly celebrated, and that is in the Jewish Seder. And the Jewish Seder, as it has been brought in to people that call themselves Messianic Jews, that say we believe in Jesus Christ, so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's not this do, it's that do. And I want to explain this to people because people don't understand. And I have ignorantly participated in Messianic Jewish seders. I will never do so again. It's defiling. It's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because Jesus said this do. And we better not go beyond what's written. But this will just give a little history to help people understand. And when people understand the facts, they'll readily understand why it's so wrong. 
Now, I'm going to read from the Anchor Bible Dictionary, and this is from the article on unleavened bread and Passover. And this is what it says. And this same information you can find from any credible source. It says, first and second century rabbinic authorities, as represented in the Mishnah, restructure the festivals of Passover offering and of unleavened bread as part of their response to the destruction of the temple. Now, this tells us here that the Jewish Seder developed after 70 A.D., when the temple was destroyed. At that time, Jesus had been at the right hand of the Father for over three decades. This, what we're talking about, didn't exist when Jesus said, this do. It goes on to say, Mishnah Peshaim, edited AD 200, represents the earliest literary remains of such efforts. Now, this Peshaim, which is from the Mishnah, the rabbinic Talmudic writings, their Jewish Seder did not exist until the year 200 AD. Didn't exist when Jesus said this do. So when they're doing that do, they're doing something that the Christ-rejecting rabbis put together well over 100 years. after. And let's not forget that Jesus was Jewish. Yeah. So what he was doing was was the right way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to read, we're going to read from Brother Edersham, a Jewish, Jewish, Jewish guy ethnically, whose father was a world-renowned Hebrew scholar. And he's going to really speak to this in a way that's going to really bring some clarity. It goes on to say, the text not only focuses on the preparation and details of the Passover sacrifice, but defines leaven and unleavened bread, the rules for searching for leaven, and the protocol for a meal ushering in the festival. The account of this meal, chapter 10 in the Peshaim, implicitly introduces fund, and listen to this, implicitly introduces fundamental changes into the rite by reworking the domestic sacrificial version of the Passover observance. They changed it. Mm. And this change took place beginning. It started after AD 70. And when they read, uh, and this is Messianic groups, They'll read right from the Haggadah, it's called. And in the Haggadah, which is rabbinic Judaism, this is where they're reading their Jewish Seder when they're doing it. Now, how in the world, when Jesus said this do, we don't do that, and we're going to take this document put together by rabbinic Jews. And yeah, this is what we're, we're not going to do this, we're going to do that. This is not just wrong, it's sin. It's disobedience to the commandments of Christ. And when we understand the holiness and the sanctity and the importance of the Lord's Supper, it will be impressed upon us just how wrong this is. And I understand I was sucked into this myself. Uh, You know, it was popular, and I just um, I went along with it. And I guarantee you, I was convicted by the Holy Spirit when I sit through it, Mm -hmm. because these prayers that are prayed, they're not Christian prayers, they're rabbinic prayers. So, Well, I guess uh, I understand why the rabbinic Jews do this, because they don't believe Jesus is who he is. Sure. So I understand why they wrote their thing and do their thing, but then, but for Christians— Messianic, you know, Jewish. It's, it, you said in one of our earlier DOCs that the, the word uh, Christian Jew or a Messianic Jew is just, they don't go together. It's an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron. Yeah, it's an oxymoron. It, it is. And um, 
and it, and it's it's wrong. And I think if people would just think about this for a minute in so many areas, but the command of Christ, this do, it's the Bible, not the Haggadah, that's our guide. And this is from Wikipedia. And this stuff is so easily found. Uh, I'm not bringing some obscure information here right from the Wikipedia on the Haggadah. It says, according to Jewish tradition, the Haggadah was compiled during the Mishnaic and Talmudic periods. It could not have been written earlier than the time of Rabbi Yehuda ben Ele, 170 AD. This is the oldest it could possibly be, 170 AD. And they know that because of the rabbis they quote in it. So that's like 140 years after Christ. Yeah. It could not have been written earlier than the time of Rabbi Yehuda ben Ele, 170 AD, who is the last Tana to be quoted therein. So this is what we're talking about. This is the facts of the situation. Messianic Jews who celebrate the Jewish Seder instead of what Christ laid out, you are disobeying the clear command of Jesus Christ, this do. And in place of that, you, you have forsaken the word of God as your guideline, and you are picking up the Haggadah of rabbinic Judaism, and you're following that. Now, that's just, uh, it's sin. It's sin. This is what we're all about on the DOC. We're calling people to come back to Jesus Christ his doctrine, his word, and to the Bible. You see, we shouldn't have to have the argument, Jimmy, that it's not the Haggadah, it's the Bible. But we have to have this argument. And I know a lot of people don't realize. I didn't. I didn't realize well, that's, that that's I what had I was gonna... the word of God and was following a book written by the ones that rejected him. That's what I was going to ask is like, how many Messianic Jewish or Hebrew movement people realize this, do you think? And I'm or sure do you think they have their own copies of these these books, the Talmud, the the Haggadah, all these things? You think they have those? Oh, yeah. And I know a lot of people that put these satyrs on, they're reading right out of the book when they do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where it comes from. And, you know, they'll put it in a little Jesus stuff in it, but something that Brother Edisham said, and, you know, when they do that Jewish Seder, they, they have a seat there for Elijah, and they're looking for their Messiah to come. And as Brother Edersham said, the Messiah of rabbinic Judaism is the Antichrist of Scripture. They rejected the true Christ, and they're looking for the Antichrist. And as the Apostle John said, that if you deny that Jesus Christ come in the flesh, this is antichrist and deceiver. Now, this isn't brain surgery. It's logical conclusions that when people reject Jesus Christ come in the flesh, we shouldn't be following them. We need to be following the Bible. This isn't a deep spiritual concept here. It's just a matter of calling people to repentance, to come back to Jesus Christ in the Bible. And I understand that this just doesn't become clear in a lot of people's minds. So hopefully what we'll be doing, and I know it will do that for many people, that they're going to see this, they're going to repent, and they're going to join us in following the doctrine of Christ and Amen. what he commanded unto us. Amen. Because because that's what it's all about. Um, in the epistle of Jude, in the third verse, and this is what we're doing. This is what we do every week. Uh, this is what the Puritans did. Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's what we're doing. And I always ask people, who delivered it? You know, wasn't Paul, wasn't John, wasn't Moses. It was Jesus. He delivered the faith unto the saints. He sealed it with his own blood. That's what we're fighting for. 
to get back to that faith that was once delivered. And in this instance, it was delivered there in the Gospels this do. That's what we're fighting for. Let's get back to the Word of God. Let's get back to the Bible. Let's get back to what Jesus said. So that's our fight. Now, I want to read from John Owen and the the eighth volume of John Owen's works. And I tell you what, he has a belly buster in here. And he has a teaching in this, which he entitled, the chamber of imagery in the church of Rome laid open and he laid it open. (laughs) I guarantee you. And as I read this, I understood the importance of the Lord's supper and why it's necessary that we have to spell out and point out what's wrong because people will just stumble right into them. And we we have to emphasize the necessity and the obligation to obey Christ all the way over and over. John 14, 23 and 24. If you love me, you'll keep my words. If you don't, you'll do something else. You love Jesus. It's going to be this do. You don't love him. It'll be that do. And there's no wiggle room here. Well, I love Jesus, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to use the Haggadah. No, it doesn't wash. We we learned it, that last week. Yeah. The manifestation of Christ. Yeah. The, the, this is those for those verses are still ringing hard in my ears. The, yeah. John, was it 14, 21, 23, 14, and 24? 21 through 24. And it's not like the father's up there and said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to teach this. I'm going to send my son. He's going to give you the word Then I want 10 preachers to get together and we'll vote on what to do. That ain't how this works. <laughs> that ain't how it works. If you love me, you'll keep my words and it'll be this too. If you don't, you'll be over with the, that do much. And, uh, this is it. And this is where, um, the the dividing line takes place. You know, Jesus said, uh, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And it'll divide. And there's got to be a division. We've got to make a division and to have that purified remnant. And we're going to see also as we get into these texts, this is a part of the purification of the bride. The bride is getting herself ready and we're preparing ourselves, And we're doing that by cutting away all the dross. If when we identify it, it's gone and, uh, it's real simple. It's not something that's, it takes a great intellect to understand. It's just, here it is, bread and cup, this do, And there you go. Mm. But I want to read some things that brother Owen said. And, um, I want to read the text, uh, in the gospels in John chapter one, verse 12, and the way that Brother Owen applied this to the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of John in chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, I want to read the way that um, Brother Owen applied this. This is on page 562 of volume eight of John Owen's works. He said, there is a peculiar exercise of faith in the reception of Christ as his body and blood are tendered and exhibited unto us in the outward signs of them. For though they do not contain carnally the flesh and blood of Christ in them, nor are turned into them, yet they really exhibit Christ unto them that believe in the participation of them. Faith is the grace that makes the soul to receive Christ and whereby it doth actually receive him. Now, When we take the Lord's Supper, we are receiving him by faith. 
It's an actual spiritual connection between the Christ at the right hand of the Father and us. It's not some dead ritual or some dead ceremony. We are receiving Christ into our souls. We receive him when we are born again, but we are receiving that communion with him in a direct connection between us and Christ. And if we miss that, we miss the whole purpose of it. We are receiving him as our Lord in that fellowship and in that communion. That's why that word communion is used. Now, on uh, in the text, I want to read the text in uh, John chapter 6 and verse 53. This is another text that is erroneously applied so many times. John chapter 6 and verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And Mr. Owen commented on page 560. He said, there is in it an eating and drinking of the body and blood of Christ with a spiritual incorporation thence ensuing, which are peculiar under this ordinance. But this special and peculiar communion with Christ and participation of him is spiritual and mystical by faith, not carnal or fleshly. Now, he dropped a word on there. It's mystical. It's a mystery. It's not some goofy, new age, goofy thing, but it's an actual receiving and experiencing Christ. I'm talking about really experiencing him, really coming into spiritual contact with the Christ that is at the right hand of the Father. This is what the Lord's Supper or communion, it's rightly called communion, that's what it's about. We have to understand that we are connecting ourselves spiritually and mystically, if you will, with Christ, and infusion into our souls, as Owen put it. Mm. I mean, and you see, if we're not doing this do, we're not going to get it. If we're doing that do, we're not going to get the actual impartation of the spiritual life of Christ into our souls. And, um, you know, that's one to meditate on right there. Yeah. Now, this just blows me away. This is what he says here. Um, he says, and in the room of that holy reverence of Christ himself in his institution of this ordinance, in the mystical exhibition of himself. Now, just think about that phrase. And for those of you, uh, it just uploaded tonight, I believe, the manifestation of Christ. Uh, we talked about all that that meant, and you can watch that DOC, but just listen to what this guy just said. He says, in the mystical exhibition of himself, unto the souls of believers, in the demonstration of his love, grace, and sufferings for them, they have set up a wretched image of an idolatrous adoration and worship of the host, as they call it, to the ruin of the souls of men. We have to earnestly contend for the faith of the actual receiving and of the spiritual manifestation of Christ at the Lord's Supper unto him. That's what it's all about. And we've got to bring back the focus to make it all about him, all about him. And these guys understood it. These guys understood it. That's why I love them. And that's why um, 
we can really learn so much from them. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and here we tie it into the concept of the bride and the purification of the bride. And of course, this um, uh, concept carries over into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about the, the bride making herself ready for that supper. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and in verse 2 and 3, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Now, that's what I am. When I'm telling you we got to do this and it's wrong to do that, I'm not trying to be a bad guy. I'm jealous with a godly jealousy. I want you to be purified. I want you to be right. I want you to come back to what Jesus and he said. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You see, we're jealous. We want people to be pure. And the only way to be impure is to be doing what Jesus said. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's what Sharnock said. Don't try to dress this thing up. Don't try to make it fancy. Uh, like Watson said, bread and cup, bread and cup. You know, uh, don't try to make a dog and pony show out of it. Make it all about him. Make it all about him. Make it all about coming into contact. Yes, you really can experience Jesus Christ. You really can know him. You really can have all things changed in your life. He really will manifest himself unto you. You really can hear his voice. Jesus is real. He's in your heart. The kingdom of God is within you. In this celebration of the Lord's Supper, it is a proclamation of all of the gospel, all he is about, and there's there's just so much here. Um, one more thing here I want to read from John Owen, and as I read this, it just really uh, was impressed upon me that these guys are doing the very same thing we're doing. The fight that these men had, that Sharnock, Owen, and Watson, and Bunyan, the fight they had in the 17th century, it's our same fight today. Now, I'm going to read this statement by Owen. He made it about the Roman Catholic Church in the 1600s, and there is not a thing here that we could not say today about the evangelical church in America. Listen to what he said. And we were talking also on our DOC about the prosperity pimps. We were talking about John Huss that was killed for following Wycliffe in yeah. criticizing the excess and the wealth. Listen to what Owen said. This is on page 570, volume 8. He says, look into foreign parts as Italy and France, where these men pretend their church is in its greatest glory. But what is it but the wealth and pomp and power of men? For the most part, openly ambitious, sensual, and worldly. Is this the glory of the church of Christ? Do these things belong unto his kingdom? No. But by the setting up of this image, by the advancement of this notion, all the true glory of the church hath been lost and despised. It sounds like the church in America, doesn't it, Jim? It does. Given unto greed, given unto a dog and pony show, it's time to get back to the rule. Don't go beyond what's written. Don't try to insert yourself into it. Make it all about him. It's all about him. There's nothing more important than receiving Christ and having him manifest himself. And there's another part I was reading um, where Thomas Manton, I think we read this in one of our DOCs, where he was talking about, um, it was on meditation, that was, a, it was our DOC on meditation, and he was talking about people that would have visions 
and uh, trances when they were taking the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. And because they, they they made it all about him yeah. and they knew it wasn't just some dead exercise. It was about really receiving and coming into uh, communion and relationship with him. Um, we'll read something here from Thomas Watson, and it's in relationship to first Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16. And I'll read that text and then I'll read uh, brother Watson's comment which we've already alluded to. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. It says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now meditate on that for a little bit. What does it mean to have communion with the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And Brother Watson had this to say about it. He said, why is the Lord's Supper called the communion of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 16? But because in the right celebration of it, we have sweet communion with Christ. We actually have communion with his blood because when we take that bread that represents his body, this is that body. I mean, and, and there's a whole lot more that that means in going into his death and crucifixion or identification in it, the death of the old man and to commune with that blood of Christ and to see the absolute necessity and the supremacy of it and of the power of that blood to put us in direct contact with the man that shed that blood for us on the cross, who's now at the right hand of the Father. We can have communion with the blood of Christ. I mean, uh, that's exciting. And he really will uh, manifest himself unto us. As John Owen said, he will, how do you, he will mystically exhibit himself unto you. <laughs> that just kills me. Um, you think that verse in first Corinthians is, is one of the verses though, that maybe people use to, to say, see, this is the, the real blood of Christ here. This is the real body of Christ. Once we take it. Yeah, everything. Um, like it turns into it. Right. And we're communing with it. The wine is not the blood. And and it's the bread and the cup. It's specifically. Uh, and it's what it represents. But yeah, everything in this is twisted in Catholicism to make it into a... Uh, you think you're actually, it, it, it's like to, uh, as many of them said, it would be cannibalism is what it literally would relate to. I'm pretty sure God's against that. God even said in the, in the Old Testament that you don't drink blood. That's exactly right. Yeah. And in the, in the Old Testament and also in the Apostolic Council, you're not to drink blood. And if people would just obey Scripture— you would never take part in the Catholic Mass. Well, well, think about this. When Jesus did it with that with his disciples, he hadn't died yet. He hadn't been crucified yet. His body hadn't been broken yet. His blood hadn't been shed yet. Yet that's what it represented. He was saying, it's so clear that that's symbolic, and you just remember oh. this when you oh. do this. Or is that a stretch? Not a stretch at all. I mean, that is so... and. If, in John chapter 6, we'll have to do the whole chapter on a DOC, on the bread. I am the bread of life. Well, that's a DOC. Mm-hmm. And it is by faith. And this is so explicitly spelled out that we eat and drink by faith and of the metaphors that Christ was using there. And to suggest that Jesus was expecting people to run up and bite him is just uh, such darkness. Uh, it comes from a dark heart. 
And the, the huge problem that if you go over and that do, you're going to miss the this do of the relationship of the receiving and the impartation of the revelation of Christ unto you. And that's why we have to talk about these bad things, because if you get over into the that do, you're not going to have the blessing of the this do. Yeah. We got to make it all about him. Got to make it all about him. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, the scripture says, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. And we might say that you can do that, but you can't do that and continue to be a Christian. A child of God must choose between the table of the Lord and the table of devils, as is obvious. Now, let's go back to Brother Mantine. And, oh, I love this. This is so good. Uh, on page 490 of volume 15, I tell you what, this just is so good. This is what he says. The ends of the supper are, number one, to be a badge of profession and to put a visible difference between us and infidels and idolaters or the worshipers of false gods. Let me read that again. To put a visible difference between us and infidels and idolaters or the worshipers of false gods, so that every time we come to the Lord's table, we profess ourselves to be a peculiar people unto him, or a part of that distinct society who are to hold out his honor to the world, and so difference ourselves from Turks, Jews, and infidels, and in effect, to withdraw from all false religions in the world. Amen. When we take the Lord's Supper, we are withdrawing from every false religion in the world, and we're saying it's all about Jesus. Praise God. As Christ will not be confounded with idols and devils, so neither Will he have his people confounded with idolaters and the children of the devil? Wow. Mm. What clarity. Yeah. What clarity of thought. And that's what we're doing. We're saying we're coming out. Well, let's use the Haggadah. Nah, I'm coming out of every religion. Haggadah. Catholicism, Catholicism. Name one. We're coming out of all false religions because the word of God tells us that when we learn the precepts of God, we'll hate every false way. Right. It's not about hating people. It's about false religions. And we are saying we belong to Jesus Christ and unto him. Wow. What clarity of thought and what power of understanding. Um, We'll read a text in Matthew chapter 26, 29, and I'll uh, bring in Brother Edersham here. In um, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29. And the text says here, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Now, at the time of Christ, we do know a couple of the prayers they said. And in the schools of Hillel and Shammai, they would argue over which prayer to say. So we know a couple of the prayers they said, but all of this later of uh, the modern Seder, it come on, you know, it'd be another 200 years. But I want to read what Brother Erdisham said here about this text. This is really cool. Uh, I know you like a good Western every once in a while. Yeah, here lately this, I do. 
this reminds me of an old Western. You'll just have to hear this. But on page 496 of volume two of the life and times of Jesus Messiah, but Alfred by Alfred Erdeshem, he says this. And uh, and in a footnote, I'll read here before I read it. He said, I have often expressed my conviction that in the ancient services, there was considerable elasticity and liberty left to the individual. It wasn't a, a set ceremony on what the Jews did. Uh, this all came later. There was, you know, certain things. Yeah, we will will eat the lamb and that, but wasn't all laid out in ritual like it was in the Haggadah. But anyway, he says this. This we infer from what the Lord added as he passed the cup around the circle of the disciples. And Erdesham points out several places where Christ absolutely breaks with what the Jews did as he was so good at doing. But he said no more so he told them he would speak the benediction over the fruit of the vine, nor again utter the thanks over the day that they had been preserved alive, sustained, and brought to this season. Another wine and at another feast now awaited him, that in the future when the kingdom would come, it was to be the last of the old Peshaz. <laughs> now that reminds the last of the old Peshaz. That sounds like the title of an old Western, doesn't it? The it last does. of the old Peshaz. <laughs> the first, or rather, the symbol and promise of the new. So when Christ said this do, that put an end to the celebration under the old covenant. He now is our Passover. And I want to read this text in, um, but I love that the last of the old Peshaz, um, in, uh, first Corinthians chapter five and verse seven. So what do we do? Uh, when we celebrate Passover, uh, do we look to the way the rabbinic Jews do it? And in first Corinthians, Chapter 5 and verse 7, the scripture says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. We get rid of the old leaven. In the Passover, as everybody knows, they would go through the house and they would put the leaven out and then they would have the feast of unleavened bread. Well, what did Jesus say that the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was? He says, it's leaven. It's leaven. Beware of the leaven. And when we celebrate Christ, our Passover, we have to put the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees out. We can't have a godly Passover by bringing the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees back in to the celebration of Christ, our Passover. We have to stick with the word of God and what the word of God says. I'll read Stephen Sharnock's comment on that. And um, as always, he says it so well on uh, page 509 of volume four of his works, he says this. He said the design of the Passover was to set forth Christ. We just need to let that soak in. Mm -hmm. The design of the Passover was to set forth Christ. All the sacrifices which were appointed by God as parts of worship were designed to keep up the acknowledgement of the fall of man, his demerit by sin, and to support his faith in the promised Redeemer. It was all about him. Everything in that. He was the Lamb of God. That's what he said. Be John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It's all pointing to him. And on page... Um, 
430. Another thing here I want to read by Brother Sharnock. And the more we make it all about Jesus, the more God is going to back us up in what we're doing. It's all about him. It's all about him. And on page 430, Brother Sharnock said this. This is so good. This is my body refers to the supper in distinction from the Passover, which Christ put an honorable end thereunto, not unto the continuation of celebrating the Passover, but as Christ now. Just like Erdashim said, the last of the old Peshaz. And, and this is what he said, uh, Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, as they were eating the paschal lamb, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to all his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. This is my body. I am the lamb. This is now what it's all about. This, you're doing the Passover. This is my body. I am the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We now celebrate the Passover, not with the old leaven, but we make it all about him. This do in remembrance of me. And when we do that, we're going to have something to celebrate because we're really going to come in to communion with the Christ who's reigning at the right hand of the Father. And it is gonna be absolutely awesome.